Well, good morning and welcome to our online Bible study. We're glad you're with us this morning. We are in Matthew chapter 20 and uh, we're going to be heading into in the next couple of weeks the last week of Jesus' life. And so uh, it's a great, great time to be in our study. Hope that uh, you're keeping up with the different things that we have going on. Our Wednesday encouragement and uh, our Sunday online service if you can't be with us in person or Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and we hope you can be with us and we have Sunday school at 9 o'clock uh, in the, the disciples class is meeting in the parking lot and we hope that you will uh, will take advantage of that and join us for that as we begin this morning let's go to the Lord in prayer father we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and study your word and we just ask that, uh, that our time together would be a blessing and that we would learn and that we would grow through our time in your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not a big art person overall. But, uh, but there are some things that, that I do like. And M.C. Esche is one whose things I, I really like. Uh, he has some unusual unusual things that, that he does and uh, and I don't know how well you can see this but uh, his his I don't know how his mind works he's it's a very artistic mind because it thinks far differently from from mine uh, I'm I'm pretty well left brain and linear thinker and I think that's why I like this is because it's not the way my mind generally works and so I, I see different things and you if you look at this one you see uh, impossible shapes, impossible forms, and uh, that's that, that's just fascinating to me because I can sit there and look and I think, man, how does how does he even c conceive of that? And there's no way that this could could be real. And you know, see another one here where the water seems to flow upward and then down, and you, you look at that and you go, okay, that that I don't know. It just there's something about it to me that's different. It's different from the way my mind works, but. Uh, what you see at first isn't always the whole thing. With, with his prints, and uh, I, I love this one where the men are marching up, up the steps and down the steps at, at the same time, and they're a circle. And it's, it's just one of those things that what you see at first isn't always the whole picture. Uh, you, there's more there than meets the eye. Uh, I, I, there was an artist who came to JMU when I was there, and he it was performance art. So he was, he was painting, but all the time he's painting, he's talking, music's playing, and you're looking at it going, I don't know what it is he's painting. And then he gets to the end and he's asking people, okay, what is this? And, and nobody can figure it out. And then finally he goes and he puts one little dab of paint there on the canvas and suddenly that one little dab of paint and you saw the whole picture. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to see what's right in front of you or to get the, the full picture at, at the first glance. And sometimes you can stare at something for hours and still miss what you're looking for. And we're going to see an example of both today as we look at a couple of different accounts that led up to Jesus last week before his crucifixion. So we are in Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to read, we're going to start with verses 17 through 19. So if you have your Bibles, follow along. It says, Now while Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, on the way he took the twelve aside and said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day he'll be raised to life. Now, why do you think this is, he, Jesus told the disciples this? Well, it was to show that he really was the Messiah foretold and to prepare them for what was about to happen. They were expecting a completely different kind of Messiah. Luke's account says that they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. They just weren't comprehending it. They weren't getting it. And the reason is because they had the Old Testament prophecies Jesus referred to, uh, and, but they still didn't get it because... Jesus' words didn't hit home because they had their own preconceived ideas that blinded them. 
They had their own preconceived ideas of the Messiah's mission and their place in it. They're about to argue over who's going to sit at Jesus' right and left hand when he came into his kingdom. And later they'd argue over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. On the very night Jesus would die or would be arrested. And Jesus was, uh, you know, the Messiah was thought to be a, a political king who was going to establish an earthly kingdom. Now, do we ever hear things the way we want to hear them in Scripture? Do we ever ignore the parts that, that we just don't like? Do we ever pray for those who persecute us? Do we love our enemies? Do we love the lost? Do we invest in God's kingdom or, or worldly wealth? See, sometimes we hear the things that we want to hear and we kind of skip over the things that we don't necessarily want to hear or maybe are a little more inconvenient for us or, or uncomfortable. And so, you know, we're all guilty, I think, at times of picking and choosing the parts of Scripture that we want to hear or hearing things a certain way. Uh, I know that I, I've had people come out of a worship service on Sunday or talk to me afterward and say, uh, that, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said this. And I'm thinking, I, I didn't say that. But they heard things because they, they had their own preconceived ideas. When I was in the Philippines on a mission trip, one of the local ministers, the first time we went, we needed to have things interpreted because not too many people spoke English. And one of the, the local preachers who had come for the conference volunteered to interpret for us. Now, to us, that meant we say a sentence or two, and then he repeats it in Tagalog, and, uh, and then we would go back and forth like that. But he said, no, 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 don't, don't worry about that. He said, you, you go for a minute or two, and then I'll summarize what you do. And we were kind of uneasy. We were looking at each other and not so sure about that, but we thought, okay, maybe he does this a lot. And so we'll give it a try. And uh, he reinterpreted some of the things that we said. Now, you know, some, of, some of what he, we said was our take on scripture. It wasn't reading directly from scripture, but you know, sometimes we do that. There were times when he, he would go along and he would talk for a whole lot longer than we had for the part that he was supposed to be interpreting for us. And he would go on and on. And we were thinking, we didn't say that much. And there were times when they would laugh. And we're looking at each other going, we didn't say anything funny there. And there was one time that I, I even though I don't know Tagalog, I could tell from the, the words that were kind of, English that he was translating and there was no translation so we kind of used an English version of the word, I could tell that he was saying the exact opposite of what we were saying. And so he was filtering it through his mindset and what he thought was right. And we do that all the time. What other truths have people misunderstood or ignored because the truth is, is contrary to their preferred ideas? We do that a lot. There are certain sins that are wrong. And we might think that they're wrong and we might believe that until it affects us. And it's somebody close to us who's committing those sins. And then maybe we start to question Scripture rather than question the person's behavior. Whether it's uh, premarital sex or, or homosexual activity or, or any other sin, gossip any other sin that uh, we might have a strong feeling about until it starts to hit home. And then we kind of filter it out. Uh, I, I think at times the, the criteria for leadership in Scripture that we're going to talk about uh, pretty soon, the, those criteria are things that we have a tendency to kind of gloss over at times rather than taking them seriously. And as we're going to study uh, very shortly, uh, those need to be taken seriously. And so we have to make sure that we don't just ignore or reinterpret things in Scripture because they go against our way of thinking. And I think that was part of the reason the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying here. And I think there were a number of things Jesus told them knowing that they weren't going to quite get it at the time. But I think he knew that after all of these things happened, not only would it help validate who he was, because he predicted them, 
but it would help them understand the events better. And so he told them, even knowing that they might not understand it. Now, on the heels of this, Jesus gets a request. And it really enforces just how little they understood about Jesus and what he said to them about what was going to happen to him. So let's go to verse 20. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one, that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Now, remember, this comes right on the heels of Jesus predicting his death. And he gave very specific details. But yet the disciples still don't get it. James and John will show a lot of spiritual maturity later in their lives. But right now, they're almost like my brother's grandkids. They'll ask a question about something and what it is, and I'll explain it, and then a minute or two later, they'll ask the same question. And I'll say, didn't we just have this conversation? You just asked that, and I just answered it. But obviously, they didn't get it. And it says that their mother asked for them. So we can see what probably happened. James and John probably cooked up the idea, and then they had their mom ask Jesus, probably figuring he wouldn't refuse her. I mean, who can refuse a doting mom? The fact that Mark's account doesn't mention the mom probably is because that request was coming from James and John, which we'll see when Jesus responds. Now, how weak is that? I mean, you're grown men, but you ask your mommy to go to Jesus and make a request for you? I mean, that's pretty weak. Well, they wanted the places of highest honor in Jesus' kingdom, and they expected Jesus to take over politically and militarily at some point. And they knew that this was a huge thing to ask. They were asking to be second and third in command in God's kingdom. They figured it was going to be an opportunity to have positions of big authority. And again, this is all on the heels of Jesus explaining what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. But it just didn't sink in. So let's go on to verse 22. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Now, notice that Jesus is asked the question by James and John's mother, but he doesn't respond to her. He responds to James and John because he knows the request didn't really come from the mom. It came from them. They just put her up to it. And Jesus told them, You don't know what you're asking. I think of the saying, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. Because there are so many times we think we want a particular thing, but we don't understand all the things that come with it. I mean, how often do you see teenagers all revved up and wanting to be adults? But what they want is the freedom they perceive in adults. They don't want all the responsibility like the bills. I remember wanting a car to drive, but I sure didn't want the insurance payments and the taxes and all that went with that. And that's what's happening with James and John here. They think they're asking for positions of power and authority, but because they misunderstood the nature of Jesus' kingdom, that it's a spiritual kingdom, not a political one, they don't know what they're really asking for. And, and that happens to us from time to time. I remember seeing a video of a young kid, and he was getting a, his first paycheck, and his dad and his older brother, it looked like, were recording it. And he was all excited. He was a man now, you know. And he, open, and, and he opens the check up, and he starts looking. And his face just, he goes from smiling ear to ear to... And dad and older brother know what's going on. They know what he saw. He saw all the taxes they got taken out. And they're explaining to him, you know, taking out Social Security. He said, no, I gave them my Social Security number. They said, no, no, no. You get to pay Social Security. They take those taxes out before you get them. And, and, the, and the young man was so upset. He had no idea that the paycheck he thought he earned was going to be a whole lot smaller. He wanted that freedom as an adult. But he didn't like the responsibilities for paying taxes that came with it. And the same thing has happened with the, the disciples. They misunderstood. They wanted one thing. They were asking for one thing, but they were misunderstanding because Jesus' kingdom was not a political one. It's a spiritual one. And that phrase, drink the cup, 
is a, is a figure of speech that's common in the Old Testament to describe joy or sorrow. And here it's referring to sorrow. And in many ways, they couldn't drink the cup Jesus would. They couldn't go through what he was about to go through, the immersion in judgment and suffering he was going to endure. They thought Jesus was looking to take over politically. They didn't get the fact that he was actually going to be tortured and killed. No, they said they could drink the cup he drinks and be baptized with the baptism he's baptized with, as Mark's account says, which is another common figure of speech. They didn't understand what Jesus meant. They were mentally prepared to put their lives on the line. And Jesus had repeatedly talked about taking up their cross and following him, which they would understand to mean a willingness to die for them. They have that, but they just can't understand Jesus dying. And Jesus tells them that they will drink the cup that he drinks. And Mark's account adds the metaphor of being baptized with the same baptism. But they mean the same thing. In other words, he tells them they're going to go through some of the same things he's going to go through in ways that they don't even understand in the moment. And in fact, they'll be thrown in jail. They'll be hounded by the religious leaders throughout their ministry. James would eventually be killed by Herod Agrippa. And John wasn't martyred, but he went through a long life of persecution and exile and suffering in the name of Christ. And so they, they drank from Jesus' cup in certain ways and in different ways. And they'll share in Jesus' kingdom, but not in the way they think. And even Jesus doesn't assign the key roles. That's left to God. So Jesus doesn't say that there won't be any places that are higher than others. In fact, he indicates that there are. But those assignments in his kingdom are for the Father to give out, not for him. And of course, there's the reaction of the other disciples. Let's look at verse 24. When the ten heard this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, and gave his life as a ransom for many. Now, you had to wonder what the other disciples were thinking at this point, right? I mean, put yourself in their place. It's bad enough that the two of them were plotting to get the most coveted places in Jesus' kingdom. But they stooped so low as to get their mommy involved. And some of them had been with Jesus longer, and they had been with Jesus for, uh, had all been with Jesus for a long time, doing the things Jesus asked. They had watched as James and John and Peter had gone up to the mount with Jesus. There had to be a little bit of jealousy there. Peter especially had to be upset, but probably more than all this, they're upset probably because they hadn't thought of it first. Most likely they don't understand Jesus any better than James and John, and they're upset that they got beaten to the punch. So how did Jesus deal with the situation? Well, he gets them together, and he told them the kind of rulers that they thought they were going to be revealed in their power and held it over it, it, held it over them. Uh, they, they were served by everyone else. That's the kind of ruler they thought they were going to be. They thought they were going to be the kind of ruler who other people served. And Jesus is going to correct this. And he uses that phrase, not so with you. I, I think if there's a phrase that could be a mantra for us as Christians, it's not so with you. To compare us to the world and the way everyone else thinks. Because the way everyone else thinks is different from the way Jesus thinks. And that, that mantra of not so with you, that we are to be different, uh, should, should really resonate with us and, and be uh, something that we live by. Not so with me. The world may go one way, but not so with me. You see, the mistake they made here is that Jesus' kingdom is based on servant leadership. The disciples have been trying to adapt to the current political ideas, uh, adapt their current political ideas to Christ's kingdom. We still do that today. I mean, some tr churches treat the preacher like the president, and some look at the elders and deacons like they're the Senate and the House. Uh, they're put there to represent a constituency rather than what the Bible says, that they're there to be spiritual leaders and to be servant leaders. And Mark is showing us that this isn't a new phenomenon. Even the disciples did this. And 
uh, and Matthew is showing this as well, and both of their Gospels show this to us, that even, that even the disciples did this, and Jesus had to correct them. He starts trying to instill the concept of servant leadership to them, and he'll have to do it again. At the Lord's Supper, he washes their feet to demonstrate what he means. You, you see this a lot with Jesus. His way is the exact opposite of the way the world thinks. Jesus said to love your enemies. Jesus said to forgive when you're wrong. In Jesus' math, the one who makes himself least, a servant of others, is the greatest in the kingdom. Because Jesus, who was God in the flesh, made himself a sin offering for us when we weren't worthy of such a sacrifice. He stresses that servanthood is the key to greatness in God's kingdom. And that's back to that phrase, not so with you, because Jesus' way of looking at things is so different. The world wants position and authority to lord it over people. And Jesus said, the greatest in my kingdom is going to be a servant. So Jesus starts in this section talking about the service he's going to perform by giving himself up for us on the cross. Then there's the, an argument over positions of authority in his kingdom. And he finishes by telling them that you achieve greatness in his kingdom by serving. Greatness in God's kingdom is achieved through servanthood. And if we want to be great in his kingdom, that needs to be our commitment as well. The chapter is going to end with an incident that shows Jesus' compassion to serve. Start with verse 29. It says, As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, Capernaum had been Jesus' base of sorts in the north. Now he's coming to his southern base, so to speak, which is Bethany. Jericho is a short distance from Bethany. And as they're leaving the city, they run into a couple of blind beggars. Mark's and Luke's account only mention one. And Mark's account names the one he mentioned, Bartimaeus. We're not sure why Mark and Luke only mention one of them, except that Bartimaeus probably seemed the more prominent one of the two. And so they focused on him. The crowd must have been talking for them to know that it was Jesus coming. And obviously they had heard uh, of Jesus and the things that he had done for him to call out to Jesus saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, remember, they're blind. So they have to have heard what was going on. and They have to have heard about Jesus. And look at how the crowd responds. It says they rebuked them and told them to be quiet. In other words, they wanted them out of the way. And we see that kind of reaction from crowds several times with the children who wanted to see Jesus, with the men who were bringing their paralyzed friend to Jesus to be healed, and here with the blind men. Some people were looked at as less important, and the crowd tried to push them aside. And I love their reaction. They just shouted louder. Uh, they've got a golden opportunity to possibly see and they're not going to let anyone or anything get in their way. There's a real impression left here that the blind man sees things more clearly than the ones who can see. He seems to realize who Jesus is, even though the ones who spend all their time with Jesus still have mistaken ideas about what Jesus has really come to do. The people in the crowd seem to think that Jesus has more important things to do than to worry about a blind beggar. And Jesus is going to show them differently. Let's read verse 32. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. Now, the, the same thing of those who are in authority and how they treat others is shown here. To most people, a blind beggar is someone who gets in the way, not someone you're supposed to serve. But Jesus is different. Jesus showed compassion to those others overlooked. Why do you think Jesus asked him what he wanted him to do for him? I think that's a really interesting question. Like we saw before, it asserted to the crowd that Jesus was the one who was healing the man. No one else could take credit for it. No one, else, no one could dismiss it. So he's calling attention to it in that way so that people will know who it is who's healing this man. And I think it's also to focus on what he needs to have changed. And the same is true for us. We need to admit to God what we need forgiveness for. 
It's not for God's sake, it's for ours. It helps us realize we have sin in our life that we need forgiveness for. And it forces us to acknowledge that we need God to get rid of it for us. Bartimaeus, and we assume the other one, uh, knew what they needed. It was an expression of their faith. They were willing to tell Jesus that they knew he was the only one they could turn to for healing. Mark's account adds that Jesus told them their faith has healed them and to go on their way. But notice they didn't do that. They began to follow Jesus. They want to be around Jesus even more. This whole section focuses on Jesus' view of position and servanthood. You know, today we have terms such as public servant, but a lot of them are ones that uh, afford the, the holder of the position with power and authority, and they get held over people's heads. And, that, and a lot of times that's why people want those positions. I remember a general testifying before a Senate committee years ago, and one senator asked him a question, and he responded by saying, yes, ma'am. And the senator got indignant, and she said, I would appreciate you addressing me as senator. I've worked very hard, and I've earned that title. And, of course, the general wasn't being disrespectful. That's the way you respond to a woman in authority in the military. But she made such a fuss over a title. That's when the idea of service and servanthood is mistaken. Jesus' point through all this is that his ministry is different from what they expect. And one of the primary differences is that in God's kingdom, greatness is earned through service. And this week what I want you to do is to take time during your quiet time to ask God to reveal the things in your life that need changing and to ask him to show you ways that you can be of service to others, maybe even those the world overlooks. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the example we have in Scripture, both good ones and bad ones. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us not to see things through our own lens, but to see them the way you would see them as we read Scripture. And I pray that you would help us to want to be servants and recognize that in your kingdom, servanthood is the greatest thing. And I pray that you would make us great servants. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us this morning. We hope that you have a great rest of the week. <music>